Um, okay. Dr. Velasco, how are you doing today? All right. Pretty good. Good to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Ooh. Got some weird feedback. That's uh Dr. Velasco, how are you doing today? Okay, can you still hear me? Yep. Sorry, that was strange. Got some weird feedback on Facebook. Wonderful. Um, you're coming to us from Jacksonville, is that right? Yeah, I'm home from this week. How was Jacksonville today? Uh, it's good. It's uh, this is this is where we are in Florida. It's a high of 80 today. Beautiful mm-hmm. weather. Yeah, beginning of fall. And it's I good. think I recently found out Jacksonville is the second largest city per square footage behind Houston. Is that close? It is the largest city. The largest. It's bit as large in Houston. Yeah, in the continental U.S. Um, so the only city, the only larger cities are actually in Alaska. That's because um, the city of Jacksonville back in the 70s absorbed Duval County. They became a single mm-hmm. one. So it's really, I think it's about a million people, but really spread out. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Hurts my urban right. planning heart, but, you know, important yeah. for others too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and before we get started, officially, definitely going to get into it more, but want to recognize and say happy Hispanic Heritage Month uh, for all the for everybody out there, but also all the work you guys are doing as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and I think one thing that came up, uh, Dr. Velasco, in our research is you're a little bit of a travel buff. I'm <laughs> curious if you can tell the people what you enjoy about traveling so much. And perhaps I know it's kind of hard when you always ask the favorite place to travel because everyone is probably unique, but curious if any stand out to you. Yeah, I think I I grew up uh, traveling a lot. My dad was a, a foreign service worker for Peru. Um, and so because of that, um, our parents had lived all over the world by the time they had us and then uh, made a point to take us places. So they would often take us everywhere. Um, so, you know, I've also lived in like six different countries and all over this mm-hmm. country. And I, I find that I don't have a favorite place or some places I've gone back to um, like the Dominican Republic or Mexico city um, that I just love. Mm-hmm. I think Latin culture is something that's really close to my heart for obvious reasons. Sure. Um, and uh, yeah, so those, those spots I go back, but actually we just got done booking um, a delayed uh, five-year anniversary trip um, delayed by COVID. Right to Kenya next year to see um, a buddy of ours that lives there now and to hopefully go on safari or do some beach. So yeah, that's what's on the docket. Hopefully we can do it because you know, like so many people we've had to cancel so much, um, so much of our life, but we get a lot of energy, uh, my husband and I from travel. So that's great. First time to Kenya or Africa? Uh, the Kenya, yes, but no. We actually did our honeymoon in South Africa when we first oh, wow. got married, um, and we'd we'd been to uh, I had been to Egypt uh, with my family, um, and we went to Morocco a few years ago. Um, so we like it. We just haven't been um, enough. And now that we have a buddy that lives in Nairobi, mm-hmm. um, been there a couple of years, and so he's already visited Jacksonville twice. And um, when we first started to talk about planning it, he's like. We said September of next year, and he said that's too far away. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good friend right there. Put, put, the, put the pressure. Yeah. On you. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah, hopefully that goes smooth, and Southwest and all the other airlines have everything figured out by this point yeah, by to, to, to get yeah. there safely. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, Dan, you got an incredible background, which we could probably spend a lot of time on, and I'm sure we'll touch on, but you currently serve as the Chief Operating Officer for Latinos for Education. Um, and we'd love for you to just, you know, we're going to get deeper into the, the day-to-day work, but can you tell us how that organization came to be an organization? Oh, sure. So we got started about five years ago. Um, I was the second hire after CEO mm-hmm. and someone else. Um, our friend R.D. Leva, who I think you know as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the organization was started by Amanda Fernandez, who's our current CEO and founder. Um, and the the genesis of it is, I think, not rocket science, but fairly evident as we, you know, she looked around and realized there's no one kind of aggregating Latinos. Um, so many of us have had this sort of circuitous journey through education, both as children in the system and then as um, teachers and administrators and um, leaders. 
Um, I remember talking to her, as she was getting started with the idea even, um, because we'd met a few years before the organization was started. And it was so clear, right? Like we kept being asked to be, the, there was a handful of us who kept being asked to be on everything, right? Every committee, every mayor's thing. Um, I'd recently had a um, commendation from this like mayor of New York for national service. And I was truly baffled by that because I felt like there were plenty of other people doing really important work. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I didn't think my work back then was important, but sure. I, I realized that the, the sort of pedigree I brought, all these sort of white dominant culture medals I'd been aggregating over time made it easy to hand me a mic or spotlight me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of sat with that, right? That like, huh, I, I'm benefiting from this system that is celebrating um, these metrics that are, you know, aren't truly authentic to how I view um, worth. And so I reached out to uh, Amanda. She just uh, gotten her first grant um, from the, new, the good people at New Schools Venture Fund. Uh, they were, shout out to Francis Masano and the team. Know, we had Masano, a recent yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I know. I know she was with you a little yeah. while. Ago. Um, so they're you know they're incredible. And we started with um, the Latino Board Fellowship. So I first came on to help design some of the programs. And as I was helping to do that, we kept extending the number of weeks. I was uh, essentially as a consultant because I still had a full time job. Oh, um, and as I was doing that, it became more and more evident that what I had been getting ready, what I had been getting ready to do was this, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't to go off and, you know, go down the superintendency track or commissioner track. It was to help create um, programming and offerings that were helping um, to sort of shine a light on a pathway for more people. Um, so I quit my job and came here full time. Uh, and that was about uh, close to five years ago. And so, well, it's been a it's been a good journey. Um, we have built a, a lot in the last few years. I appreciate that context. And I think first, before going farther, like important to recognize and shout you you all out as the organization doing this work specifically because, as you said, others were maybe tiptoeing around it, but it always takes a group of people to 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 do it to to put the work together to to write the grants to to build it out to build the systems to really name this is Amanda a quit her job just to go write the strategic plan yeah right? so <laughs> no income no grants it was just yep. like an idea so yep. um it, yeah absolutely i came on when we already had a little bit of money maybe um, not advised <laughs> to quit the full-time job for starting slowly yeah. ease into that yeah <laughs> of course well i joked that you know it wasn't until we had five or six people that we could even offer benefits yep. so that's a real like startup story right like you can't do that a lot of people couldn't come here because we wouldn't have benefits like you have to have enough of a um like mix really to to be able to take a leap into a startup you know well you know um, <laughs> you may not know this but i i my side hustle is a small business owner called with shrimco and i recognize how hard it is to get benefits yeah. for staff members when you're not podcasting and getting a hundred percent it's a very real thing yeah um I appreciate you sharing that. Then, you know, you know, five years in and going to talk about, you know, the recent State of Latino Education Conference that you guys put on, which was really powerful. But can you give the listening audience um, kind of an overview of the work you all do at Latinos for Education? Oh, sure. So we're a national um, education nonprofit. We're based out of Boston. Um, we aim to identify, place, develop and connect what we think is essential Latino leadership in the education sector. Um, we do that through both programmatic work, so leadership development, accelerating people into and through the education sector from the classroom to the boardroom, um, and also through advocacy work. So working both at the state level, city and state level, and the geographies where we operate, and currently in uh, Boston and in Houston, uh, but also through national advocacy, so working directly with uh, the Department of Education and the White House around the types of policies that we know are needed um, to help support our, our, our children and families um, through the education sector. Um, that's kind of the, the high level of the work that we're doing these days. And I think you have, some, well, you, not that I think you do have some really powerful data and, and programs on the website 
Um, but two that two kind of related data points that stuck out to me on the front page, 4% of leaders on education board um, are Latina and 2% of leaders are on executive teams in education orgs are Latino. Can you speak to that and why you all feel so strongly that it needs to kind of be represented on the homepage of the work? Yeah, I mean, we don't we don't want to be the only voice in the room or the only voice at the table, but we do want and deserve equitable representation in terms of educational programming, not only within schools, but the education sector at large, um, that is disproportionately serving our children, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to be one in three um, children in the public school systems in the next couple of years. Um, we're only about 8% of teachers nationally, 8 or 9%. We're only about two and 4%, as you just noted, in boards and leadership teams. And what that means is that our, the cultural competence and sort of the lived experience of the Latino um, community is consistently missing from these types of educational experiences that are being um, brought to our kids. And so we think that, I guess our big bet, if you will, is that if we put Latino children at the center of educational reform and programming on our way to serving our kids, we're actually going to serve all other children because um, our kids just have such high level um, of disparity in terms of our access to resources. So if we make it easier for Latino children and families to access mm -hmm. um, resources, we're going to serve low income kids. We're going to serve um, uh, emerging bilinguals, immigrant kids. And so... Um, we think there's a, a way to do that that is long term and that starts from bringing more teachers and finding ways to um, attract and retain Latino teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that is why we also chose to do advocacy work hand in hand with that. We're not willing to, uh, I you know, a few years ago, I would have said, I'm not going to trick Latinos into becoming teachers if there mm -hmm. isn't going to be a pathway to the middle class for them mm -hmm. through teaching in their communities. And so uh, we've launched teacher facing and teacher retention programming through the Latinx Teachers Fellowship um, a couple of years ago, at the same time that we were also working with legislators um, to help make sure there are those pathways, right, that um, we're providing, you know, debt forgiveness and that there's pathways to um, uh, uh, credentialing that are providing sort of the guardrails that our community needs. And it's so strategic to be able to do it and provide supports at the policy level, but also at the at the ground level, or at the teacher level as well, because as you said, we don't want to be supporting or in inviting teachers into systems or environments that aren't safe or nurturing to them or set them up for success as, as humans and vice versa. If they're not set up for success as humans, likely can't be their best selves in front of kids in, in front of the classroom. I mean, exactly that. Yep. You know, I think of my own experience as a teacher. I left the classroom after two years um, teaching in Silicon Valley because I lived with five other people. There wasn't a world in which I wasn't going to live with five other people if I wanted to help contribute at home, which I, which many of us need to. Sure. Um, and that kind of sucked because I was a good yep. teacher, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm I'm still in touch with a lot of my former kindergartners and their families, and and I love that aspect sure. of my career and do feel like I missed out on being able to stay in the classroom. Um, so. No, I think that's right. And I don't know if I was a good teacher, but I enjoyed it and still keeping, you know, in touch with my kids as well. But to your point, you know, have many moments reflecting back when I was looking at a textbook or looking at new policies that were passed, thinking like, how in the hell did this get passed? And how is this going to help my kids? And how long is it going to take before those like ever hits? The front of the classroom. So I think it's not easy for an organization to both be focused on the policy work and the the day to day teacher work. But to your point, if not groups like yours, the disparities between the two often go without kind of being brought together. Right. Um, and I think that kind of leads into a little bit of the recent, well, all the work, but also specifically the um, state of Latino education. Can you speak to kind of why you guys put that on and some of the outcomes of that? Yeah, I mean, that was... Um, and, and congrats, even before you dive in, sorry <laughs> to cut you off, but just for pulling that off, for getting some of the, the speakers you had on. I mean, the parts we were able to join were really powerful. Yeah, our, our team did a, a spectacular job with that. I, I will say, like, you know, from from my seat, we, we recently hired a, a chief policy and advocacy officer, uh, Dr. Um, Feliz Ortiz Licon, who's, um, who's sort of masterminded pushing that through the last mm -hmm. few months. Um, it was definitely a huge team effort. Um, to get um, that event. It was multiple days across different geographies, all, all virtual, but 
Um, we had, I think, close to 900 attendees across That's three incredible. days, which was um, which was awesome. We had something like 1,500 or 1,800 registrants. Um, so we saw a really good uh, conversion in terms mm -hmm. of what you see in those types of virtual spaces. But yeah. we did that because it's never been done before. And I, and I think that's the thing where, where we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just yeah. saying we need a spotlight. Like, just like, um, you know, there's Cancer Awareness Month or Breast yeah. Cancer Awareness Month because breast cancer is such a powerful disease that is like tackling so much of our community mm -hmm. and it gets a spotlight. Latino education needs to be spotlit because our, our, our gaps are just that much larger. And we're just now going to start seeing the true effects of COVID on our communities. And so um, the data wasn't great two years ago. Like it hasn't been great. Mm -hmm. It isn't good now. Like it hasn't gotten better. It's only going to get worse over the next two or three years. And, and I don't say that I guess for those that know me, I'm a baseline optimist. Like I enter the world like glass half full, right? right? And I feel like we're at the beginning of something fairly catastrophic unless we do some, we take some fairly bold actions in terms of shoring up the education sector. And that's not just for Latino kids. That's like mm -hmm. at large, um, the profession is going to see a huge downturn um, in terms of people leaving the profession, because it's been really tough for folks um, working in schools. Um, so our hope is that we're, I've always thought of our advocacy work as uh, sort of watchdogs, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we don't lobby, uh, but we do bring together the folks that are expected to stand up for our kids. We get them to make commitments about what makes sense to our community. And then we will hold them to that, right? We will circle back around. And this is not a one and done event. This is the beginning of um, ongoing research and convenings that will uh, help to hold our elected and appointed officials to the fire, if you will, from a from a critical friendship vantage point, right? Mm -hmm. That we're not coming for them. We are helping to ensure that our voices and our community's needs are centered when decisions are being made on behalf of our kids. Recognizing right. that, like, no one knows what we're doing. No one's felt, no one's dealt with COVID before, right? right. No one's yep. dealt with the pandemic, uh, but we weren't doing a great job before. And so we, we definitely don't want to go back to the way things were. Right. Like where people say re-enter, they say we want things to go back to normal. Normal was pretty crappy for a lot of kids and families. And so we're, we're trying to rebuild in a different way, right? To like yep. re reconstruct, reimagine, re-engineer how the schools serve our kids. I appreciate that. I think naming, you know, number one, that the previous reality pre COVID was not great for many kids, particularly in, in under-resourced communities um, and, and adults either. Um, I think two, to your point as well, reminding all of us that in these semi-heated or passionate conversations, we're all in the same communities, the same country, all want from hopefully for the most part, all kids to have access to high quality education. And so if, if we can agree on some of those basic premises, Perhaps we can work collaboratively together across political lines, uh, you know, different education ideologies to really mm -hmm. make sure we're moving in the right direction to your point. Because right now, and even pre-COVID, I think there's a lot of data points that prove we weren't moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um, I think you, um, sorry, you got messed up on my tabs. Um, you know, continue to bring up those, those good points where I appreciate, and I think even going a bit deeper, you know, you and know, I had conversations just about the importance of, of disaggregating data, but also the terms in which and the data we're looking at this sort of information. Um, can you talk about, you know, from your vantage point and your experience, why terms and language are important in this work as we're looking at data and then kind of building needs from that data? Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a, our country's in a moment of uh, racial awakening, if you want to call it that, right? I think we've had these like waves over the decades. I think we're in one. Um, I celebrate that. I think that's great. I think we need to do more and be better. I think, unfortunately, the Latino lens or the Latino experience tends to get kind of ignored or clumped together as people of color. Um, you know, we've talked about the term BIPOC, and it's, it's a term I don't like because it inherently leaves out, like, it, it doesn't have a, a, Latinos are kind of washed out of it. And so I find that oftentimes on whether it be boards or committees or, you know, we're 
whenever I'm sort of witnessing data being presented, um, we get clumped as, you know, oh, we're going to bring in more teachers of color. It's like, I get that, but what does that actually mean for what is your target for Latino teachers? Because while we can, while like it's good for, you know, for us to have diverse teachers, we really need to start to close some of those gaps with Latino teachers, mm -hmm. right? In, in cities like LA and Houston and the Bay Area and New York, um, Boston, we have double digit gaps, right? Like from 11%, I think Boston Public Schools um, has uh, Latino teachers to, I think it's about 44, 45% of the student body, right? So it's just like the, it's, there's not even gaps. These are abysses. And so, so to clarify for the audience, the, the, the gap we're talking about is, you know, equitable representation at, at the teacher level compared to the student level in those schools. Yeah. Thanks so. for that. And so I think the, the nomenclature is important. I mean, even, even using the, you know, and this I'll say is a, a personal thing of mine. Like I tend to not use the term Hispanic um, because it's a term that was used, was created by, you know, the Nixon administration to, just kind of clump us together during the, the census. And so um, I tend to identify more as Latino. And I think, and I even say like, you know, Latino Heritage Ma a Month or Latinx Heritage Month. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that, some of those uh, choices are personal. Um, but I think that when we don't, uh, when we don't at, at a baseline disaggregate the data and disaggregate the nomenclature, then it's very easy for us to continue to live in the shadows. Um, and so part of it is that, is like getting, getting, giving it some light and some air that some of the data is gonna be messed up, right? Like it's not gonna look good. Um, we ran some of the data for Massachusetts, for example. And I wanna say something like more than 70% of school districts in Massachusetts don't have a single Latino teacher. 17%. Seven zero. Seven zero seventy percent. Yeah, there's. Wow. I can I can send you the actual numbers of it because last year I I like got the data from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, hmm. and it was. I mean, what's the, what's the right terminology for it? Um, it was really sad data. Um, it was discouraging to see that, like, in a state where there are so many of us, where in the most populous city where 45% of the student body, mm -hmm. um, we still haven't made, you know, our like step when taking the right steps mm -hmm. that you have this. And, and I have a number for both like those that have less than five teachers and those, those that have zero. And it's cool. like more than 50% for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it gives us a reason to exist, I suppose, from like a, like viability market need, if mm -hmm. you will. But we know that there's a need for us, not only where we operate, but we're constantly being asked, like, why aren't you in the Bay Area? Why aren't you in Miami? Why aren't you in Arizona? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get there. <laughs> we're coming. <laughs> we got a lot to do here. Yeah. Um, I, think so. I mean, we'd certainly encourage our audience, and I appreciate you lifting those up to really take those, those terms and other terms into consideration, right? But also just the importance of understanding the data, disaggregating it in all the ways it should be. And then using it to really understand the best way to move forward with it. And I think you and I from current and previous work and many others know, sadly, without groups like yours, there's not many school districts or state level departments of education really looking at this data across um, educators and educators of color and, and students and students of color as well. So without groups like yours and understand the importance of it. There's, you know, to our knowledge, a lot of this data isn't even widely known and there are not many responses happening because there's no data to even know what they're working towards. It's, you know, maybe, I, maybe I get stuck into, in this terminology, but my, my uh, husband's a cancer doctor. And so I think, I think of it in this terms, like until you can't treat cancer until you know it's cancer. Yep. Right. And so we can't treat this issue, this like endemic problem in our, in like our education industry until we call it out and just mm -hmm. like shine some light on it. And like, here is the problem. Now we can start to like create strategies to overcome it. Um, but, you know, being in the room where like, I've been in the room where I've asked, like, what about the Latino numbers or what about reading and writing and reading and math? Yep. Um, and that data is not readily available. And so it's just kind of like wild goose chase to get sure. it. Um, so we just have to own many of us didn't create the system, right. right. But we've chosen to step into it. Um, and I think part of our onus, I suppose, is to help re-engineer it. 
right? The system is doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is right. to celebrate and uphold a certain community and to like keep other communities in the shadows and not with the same level of access. And so we have to tell the system to do something different. Um, I think that's sort of the painful work that takes time to do. And when you talk about, you know, re-engineering and kind of bold strategies to fix the current education system, you know, I think you personally have worked or at least supported educators in the traditional um, public schools as well as kind of uh, public charter schools as well. Um, can you talk about um, perhaps successes you've seen in, in both of those? And I think also in, in our work, right, we've seen biasly pros where those sorts of schools can collaborate and share best practices, whether it's around supporting educators of color, um, whether it's around best practices for family engagement or literacy or math. Curious about what you've seen from your own professional experience from both of those lens. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I have worked in both. Um, I, I will say at Latinos for Ed, we are agnostic. We think it's the wrong fight to have, like the public charter versus public district schools. Um, our communities don't actually care. Like we yeah. just want our teachers to be well resourced. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and our kids to have like competent, culturally sensitive teachers that, that are great at their craft. Yeah. Um, but so that said, having worked in both in both systems, um, full disclosure, I'm on a charter, national charter network board. Um, but I also work hand in hand with, for example, the Well County Public Schools, like on my free time for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to just advise wherever people ask for my opinion. Um, and so I think where we've seen um, schools and systems take steps um, that have been successful, um, I would say wherever, I mean, not to shine a light on our own work, but to be honest, like it, we run a fellowship called the Aspiring Latino Leaders Fellowship, right? Mm -hmm. And right now we have about 60 participants that um, where school systems have bought seats for them in our program, right? And so we, we have Boston Public Schools, mm -hmm. Yes Prep in Houston, um, Rocketship Public Schools in the Bay Area, and then a myriad of other district and charter schools from around uh, those three geographies uh, that have said, like, we want our people to be in these spaces, right? And I think, you know, show me, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you care about. Um, I think a lot of school systems or leaders are always, you know, saying the right thing, but when it comes to actually allocating resources, people are always like, oh, sorry, we can't, you know, we can't invest. It's you true know, in the all. personal finance world too, <laughs> for our yeah. friends out there struggling <laughs> with personal finance. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I'll, I'll see, I'll share something I, I found interesting. So a year and a half ago, we launched the Latinx Teachers Fellowship um, and we decided to pay participants to be a part of it. We paid everyone a $500 stipend to be a part of the summer program. Okay. Um, we like sort of showcased that when we spoke with Houston ISD um, in like why we felt that that was important. And this last summer, they decided to directly pay participants that participated in our fellowship, um, which I think underscores again that like their professional development should be an investment that the district makes because that is how both you retain people, that is how you attract people to come to your system, um, and that is how you give people a pathway to grow. Um, so I've seen that. I know here in Jacksonville, um, there's some work happening around uh, recruiting more Black and Latino male teachers that is sort of starting to blossom out. Um, I think that has a lot of promise. Um, yeah, I think those are the two that I would kind of point to right now. Yeah, I appreciate your sharing, man. I think too, to your point, if we can all come to a place where we want better educational systems and opportunities for all students, and we can acknowledge the previous system was not serving all students well, but that there may be pockets of excellence in a charter in the Bay Area and a district in um, the Tennessee area and another charter in Florida, like why not share resources? Why not understand um, that together kind of all boats can rise in this way. So I appreciate you sharing that perspective. And I think that is a, that is a cultural change we're seeing, right? Okay. I think when, Good. when perhaps when you and I were teachers, which I think, you know, was probably the 2006, 2008, 2008. Right? Yep. It charters were a lot held their cards or felt to me like charters held their cards a lot closer to their chest. Yes. I've seen over the last maybe five or eight years, a shift in that like modality, right? Where it's like, actually there's probably 
sufficient resources mm -hmm. for us to like work together. I think of the, the sort of analogy, like we shouldn't be fighting for crumbs. We should just be making more bread. Mm -hmm. And I think that us coming together, bringing systems together, we make a point to bring district and charter staff together in all our programs, because yeah. I think for too long, we've kind of demonized each other, like the systems have demonized one another. Um, and so once you've broken bread, not they keep pulling at the bread um, analogy here, but um, with people that are working in different systems, you start to see that there's value in both. My guess would be because we have that shared experience of bringing those two parties together. When they get together, they're, they're like, oh, you guys aren't that bad. We have the same, <laughs> you have the same challenges. We're trying to figure it out. They kind of, uh, they, I, I think in that experience, want some sort of permission and a, a middle ground, a safe party to, to bring them together, to let them know it's okay to share these ideas, these best practices um, without having one make the first move and invite them to enemy ground and that sort of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, we actually have a guest question in um, from Jahari Shelton. I'm going to paraphrase, and he gave you a meaty one, uh, Dr. Vlasco. So, uh, you know, feel free to choose any part of this meat or bread as, you know, <laughs> if we want to keep using that metaphor here. Um, so Mr. Shelton essentially asked what social, organizational, and or political challenges stand in the way of more equitable representation between Latinx students and education leaders? Ooh. And is meaty. And you have 15 seconds. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we've, we don't have the political will yet. Um, I think that we, we've not made the right choices mm -hmm. as society in terms of particularly how we choose to fund our schools. And so I think, and that actually happens at the local level. And so if you're wondering like, oh, what can I do? Like go vote for school board members. Like School board elections have really low turnouts. Um, so find out how school board members are either appointed or uh, elected in your city or county because that is where like the lion's share of education spending is decided. And so we've codified uh, spending on schools at based on a zip code and based on property taxes by and large. And so that sort of broken system is gonna to continue to create the symptoms that we see um, until sort of the hand of civil society gets in there and says, actually, this is not okay. Yep. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest question around it. I think that's good. And it's a, it's a reoccurring pattern from guests on this podcast around not only how important it is to vote, um, consider running for school board comes up a lot that actually our friends at the eight black hands released their podcast yesterday or this morning was all focused on encouraging leaders of color to run for uh, boards of education but also to your point around the education piece not many know right duval county charlotte mecklenburg billion dollar a year organizations uh, lausd like with a b mm -hmm. like really huge incredible budget has one hundred and twenty thousand students in its purview yeah that's an not nothing, you know. No, I mean, I mean, think <laughs> I mean, about, think about even, even outside even of budget, the the logistics of of busing and cafeteria and the amount of food, right? And like all these things. Like to your point, it doesn't get the credit, but perhaps you know more organ you know, organizations like yours continue to do great work to to lift up the importance of that. Yeah, I'm gonna get you out of here on a few hopefully fun questions. <laughs> we may have touched it, but we're gonna ask you anyways, Dr. Velasco. One actionable thing our listening audience can do to support your work? Well, to support our work, I would, I mean, follow us, right? Like we're a startup. Mm -hmm. um, we're next week will be 21 strong. <laughs> um, when there were four of us, we used to say we got to show up like a team of 10. Now mm -hmm. that there's 21 of us, we try to show up like a team of 100. Um, we can only do that in so much as we have ongoing support uh, from people like you, Greg, and from the community, um, helping to elevate the work and amplify um, the impact of what our teams are trying to do. So if you don't follow us on social media and uh, are not part of our network yet, please, please do that. Um, but I, I would also say, other than yes, go register to vote. If you are not registered to vote, figure out who your uh, school board members are. Um, it's okay to be involved. You know, some people think, um, that you know, we put it in the trusted hands of our elected officials. Um, ask questions. You know, go to school board meetings. Uh, there's you'll you'll be surprised how much you can learn and um, 
how influential your questions might be and how many more people might be wondering the same thing. Yeah, I appreciate that. And we'll definitely put all the links to, to support you all in, in our show notes and get the audience to do the same. Um, can you share what square pizza reminds you of? Yeah, middle school cafeterias. <laughs> Positive or negative? <laughs> you, you, you answer that pretty down the middle. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think positive. I think, you know, I only, I, I finished middle school in the U.S. Um, I went to three different middle schools in three different parts of the world and always started at different times of the year. Um, mm. But I do remember feeling a certain kind of joy on pizza day. There we go. That's <laughs> what we're going for. I appreciate that. Um, so a little bit of a research question of those three middle schools in the world, I think somewhere international, as you said, did they all serve square pizza or was this only a domestic treat in the United States? It was just an American truth. Okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, definitely not in, in Latin America. <laughs> Probably for the best. Um, Dr. Flasco, thanks for joining. Thanks for all the work you do. Um, and we appreciate, we appreciate everything. Thanks, Greg. Good to be here.